Well, um, thanks so much all of you for being here today. I feel enormously privileged to have been presented with this opportunity and also to be showing in the Salt Spring uh, National Art Prize Art Exhibition. Um, there is some truly phenomenal work in this exhibition, so it really humbles me to be showing alongside it. Um, I've never actually spoken about my artwork in public before, so this is a bit of an experiment for me and I hope you'll bear along with me. Um, I'm not going to be talking too much about my own art today um, because I, I'm much more interested in talking about the ideas which compel me to, to do what I do and my hope is to participate in a larger conversation about art and art making and particularly uh, about painting. So I will talk about the, the particular painting that's in the show, Acolyte Number 2, uh, later on. But to, before I do that, I'm going to talk about some sort of broader ideas and maybe we'll, ha we'll have a chance to unpack those uh, later on. Um, I guess what I'd like to start with, the, the key question for me uh, as a painter is, well, what, what is the number one issue facing a figurative painter today? Uh, I identify as a figurative painter. And what I mean by that is, is I render images which are ostensibly uh, objective. They are ostensibly things which appear to be in the world, either from my mind's eye or literally observed from sight. So I don't identify as an abstract or non-objective painter. Um, but this question of, of what the number one issue facing figurative painters today, uh, it doesn't apply just to me, of course, it applies to all figurative painters and actually I'd make the argument it applies to most people. Um, I have a theory, and it's just a theory, that if you were to go around the world and give any child a piece of paper and a pen and ask them to draw, uh, they will almost certainly draw something. They will draw some kind of object. Uh, I typed uh, children's drawing into Google, and this is one of the results which came up. And you know, the vast majority of the images which I saw were images of houses and uh, character, you know, family members on the lawn. There's usually a son in there of some kind. Um, it's my opinion that we all have a deep need to respond to the world around us. We have a deep need to represent it in some way. Um, and I, I think this need continues with us even as we, as we become adults as well. I mean, I think we've all sat on the phone and while well, we've been put on hold with someone, we start doodling on a notepad. It just comes to us naturally. So this question of um, what is the issue facing figurative painters, I think that's a universal question. Um, there are quite a few challenges facing figurative painters. We are absolutely inundated with images in the moment we're living in right now. Uh, at this very moment, there are probably more images being photographed and uploaded to the internet than have ever existed in the universe prior to some point in the early 2000s. Uh, there are images everywhere and they compel our attention in all manner of ways. Uh, there are images which want us to buy things, there are images which want us to vote for a certain candidate. Uh, there are images which want us to believe a certain idea or to uphold a certain standard of beauty. And taking images is now easier than ever as well. We all have our smartphones. I should also mention, of course, we have Instagram. I think it, Instagram is a really important, uh, I mean, obviously Salt Spring is doing a lot of its marketing through Instagram. Instagram has now displaced Facebook as the most popular social media platform. Most young people, I think, at least in the West, uh, will access information about their world, primarily through Instagram. There will be other sources as well, but I, I think that's the first port of call, so to speak. And this is a testament, I think, to the enormous power that images hold over us, that, that this is how so many people choose to navigate their world. Um, but it's not just that we're inundated with images. Um, we're also in a situation now where images, uh, we have reason to be skeptical of them. We've become much too wise uh, as a human race, I feel. Um, this here, this is a, 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 an image. It's called a portrait of Edmond de Bellamy. It was sold at Christie's last year, uh, December 2018, for $432,500 US dollars. It's a fair price. Um, this image was not made by a human. It was made by an algorithm. Uh, specifically, there is a French collective of artists and one of their projects 
is uh, they are creating portraits of a fictional French noble family called the De Bellamy family, and they've developed algorithms which can. But what they basically do is they scour through the internet looking uh, for portraits made between uh, something like the 16th to the 20th century, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. This algorithm searches through those images, and then another algorithm takes those images and kind of processes them, and it can try and determine whether it's a real or fake portrait. And this specific image was one of the first which passed through the sensor that this uh, algorithm has to determine if something is real or not. So, I mean, although looking at it, uh, it has a certain, I don't know if we'd necessarily believe that it's a real painting, looking up close, I'm sure if this was in an antique shop window or in a value village, just walking down the street, probably wouldn't pay a second glance at it. Um, this is the kind of world we're living in now. Uh, it's always been an issue, but it's been certainly being compounded since 2016 with the, the rise of these algorithms which are able to uh, control uh, the images that we see and uh, highly mediated in the world we're living in. So we're surrounded by, oh, well, I'll do a Q&A at the end if uh, people have questions, or do you want to, do you have a question, sorry? You know, I don't, I think it's a, I think it's an inkjet print. It might be, there's some sort of printer which um, is able to uh, create the effect of oil paint on the canvas. And certainly you can go to any number of shops and have digital, digital images printed in a way to make them look like oil paintings. And there are entire industries dedicated to this. So yeah, it's a, the technology is very advanced for sure. So we're all figurative painters, in my opinion, uh, but we're surrounded by images. And then the images that we're surrounded with are, uh, we have reason to be skeptical of them and we process them very quickly. And I think in this kind of environment, it is very hard to make images which connect with someone, which, which stand up from the crowd, which uh, cause you to, to stop and pay attention. Um, but I think, there's, I think there's an even more pernicious challenge, which is not uh, how to make an image which stands out, but it's how to make a meaningful painting. And that's the question which compels me as an artist. How can I be a, a meaningful figurative painter? How can I make meaningful figurative paintings? Um, and I think this challenge, it, it affects figurative painters specifically, not all artists. For all, certainly all artists have the challenge of how to make a meaningful artwork. But I think there is a very specific challenge that figurative painters face that other kinds of artists don't face. And to illustrate what I mean by that, I'm going to talk about the difference between representation and presentation. So this is kind of, it's kind of an academic idea, but I've got some images which will kind of unpack what I'm talking about. Um, I'm indebted to these ideas, the sort of distinction between representation and presentation uh, due to a lecture delivered by the artist Lai Wan. Lai Wan is a Vancouver-based artist uh, she works uh, with nature. Uh, she is very interested in what the relationship between a human body and the natural environment is and, and how human beings affect the world around them. Uh, so a lot of her art is not based in particular objects. It's based in going out into the world and having discussions with people, conducting performances, doing research. It's very non-object based. Uh, I uh, was fortunate enough to experience a lecture by her at the University of British Columbia a few years ago. And she was talking about her own influences. And one of the influences she spoke about was uh, this work. This is by an artist called Hans Hacker, who was, uh, I believe, an Austrian artist active in the, after the Second World War. He's mostly well known for what's called institutional critique, which, which means he, he built fictional museums and he populated them with fictional objects and he did this in an effort to try and criticize the idea of the museum itself, the supposed authority uh, that these institutions have. He was very keen to unpack that and ask who, who's, really, who's really controlling these spaces and, and what's at stake here. Um, that's what he's most well known for, but what's less well known is that he also worked a lot with the environment. He made environmental art. This piece is called Condensation Cube. Dates all the way back to 1965, and as you can probably guess, it's a cube with condensation inside. It has a little bit of water, and it's a very simple piece. Uh, the condensation will appear depending on the temperature differential between the interior of the cube and the outside of the cube. So if you go into a room uh, where the condensation cube is present, 
the content of the cube will inevitably change in response to your presence. So it's, it's a very active work, it's very dynamic. You will never see it in the same form twice. It's constantly in process. Uh, the reason Hans Hacker made this work was because he was part of a large group of artists who were very interested in uh, the loss of um, the loss of representation after the end of World War II. There was a lot of artists who were concerned that due to the rise of mass media, due to mass communication, it was no longer possible to make figurative artworks which were meaningful. This is two, for the reasons that I've been talking about. There's some sort of failure, some sort of failure in communication, some sort of failure in the universality of the language which is being used in the artwork. Um, you might be wondering, well, how can an artwork fail? Uh, I'll give you an, an illustration of what I mean. Uh, early this year, I was reading a book called, uh, I think it was called How to, How to Paint Fictional Universes or, fiction, or Fantasy Realism or some such thing. Uh, it's by an artist called James Gurney. Does anyone know James Gurney? James Gurney is an American artist. He's most well known for the Dinotopia universe. Oh, I'll go back here. Uh, Dinotopia universe. This is a um, fantastical series of paintings he made where he portrayed, portrays this alternative universe filled with uh, dinosaurs and humans and they co-evolved alongside each other and you know, there's sort of these incredibly lustrous worlds filled with all sorts of pterodactyls and allosauruses and people are riding them. And it's, it's really wonderful. Uh, the work is very, very popular. Uh, in addition to doing those works, he's also done a lot of illustrations. Uh, he's frequently commissioned to do works for publications like National Geographic. He was commissioned to make this work for National Geographic, I believe, in the early 1990s. It's called The Sinking of the Cumberland. Uh, what you're seeing is the sinking of the USS Cumberland uh, after, as it faces off against the CSS Virginia in the state of Virginia during the American Civil War. So the CSS Virginia, of course, this famous ironclad dreadnought, the first of its kind, just totally decimated uh, the USS Cumberland. Uh, they were helpless against it. Uh, to make this painting, I read that James Gurney went out to the historical site of the battle and he went out and spoke with historians and he went to ships which are still around, which date from that era so that he could look at the original architecture of the ships, their rigging, the cloth, and so on. Um, he, he went and read all the memoirs of the people who survived that day to know what it was like. Um, he then took dozens upon dozens of photographs of himself posed in different ways to get all the different uh, postures for the sailors on the ship. He bought his own sailor uniform so he, would, he could get a very uh, accurate model. Um, and then he did study after study after study. He did a color study, he did a value study, he did compositional studies. Um, so on and so on. And if you look at the work, it's, I, I mean, I think it's a fantastic work. You, know, you look at the way the, the, the light of the fire is rec uh, reflected in, in, in the water and you can see, if you look carefully at the sailors jumping off the, the other end of the boat, um, there's motion blur on their models to show how quickly they're actually moving through space. And if you look way down in the lower right, uh, you can actually see the, the little drummer boy Apparently there's a true story of a, of a drummer boy who jumped off the side of a boat and he used his own drum as a flotation device. So the, his painting is it's filled chock full of detail. Um, this is a really earnest effort to try and represent this particular historical moment. It's thoroughly researched. It's a truly succulent image, I like to say. Um, I want to compare this image to another image of a naval tragedy. Does anyone recognize this artist? Turner? Yes, Turner. Very famous. Um, J.M.W. Turner. Uh, this painting is called Snowstorm Steamboat Off of a Harbour's Mouth. It was first exhibited in 1842. In my opinion, this painting is the superior artwork. It's said, there is an apocryphal story, that uh, to make this painting, Turner had himself uh, lashed onto the mast of a ship as it was being taken through a storm so that he could actually paint the storm as he was in it. Now, whether that's true or not, uh, I think that that narrative captures some of the ethos behind this image, which, which led Turner to make it. Um, the storm here 
is not being represented. It's, it's literal. There is a literal storm of oil, pigment, paint on the surface of the canvas. It's not clear where the ship is in space. You can't see it in great detail. You don't really know what state it's in. You don't know if it's day or night. It's very ambiguous, but yet the painting is deeply compelling because of the way it is composed, the way the paint has been applied to the surface, the texture, the subtle variations of color, which are quasi-imaginary. It's hard to imagine a, a real-world storm looking quite like this. This is what an example, uh, this is an example of what I would call presentation whereas this is what I would call representation. With representation, you have some kind of gap. There's a distance. You have the origin, in this case, the USS Cumberland. Then there's this mediation, there's this jump which has to be made. And then there's the final image, the painting of this tragedy of the USS Cumberland. That Gurney had to sort of make that jump through painting. Here, there's no jump. There's no gap. There's no mediation. It is an immediate instantiation of the subject. You are immediately presented with what is happening. And for that reason, I feel, it is all the more forceful. And so these ideas are at the heart of uh, what has been happening a lot in art history since, uh, since the 1960s and onwards. And it's certainly the paradigm uh, in Vancouver, I think in a lot of contemporary art, environments and suddenly in the milieu I'm associated with, I come out of the University of British Columbia, a lot of the faculty out there are very concerned with working with these kinds of ideas. They're very concerned with creating presentations rather than representations. Uh, it is argued that they are more truthful, that there's a deeper value to them, that they don't have this kind of gap or this, what I would call a failure. Um, nevertheless, I'm still faced with this problem. How can I make a meaningful representational or figurative painting. So you might be wondering, well, why don't you just do what Turner does? You know, why don't you just make presentational paintings? And certainly I think in this exhibition, there's a lot of presentational art. Um, now I don't, I should mention, I don't wish to suggest that representational painting is um, without use or it, it should be ignored or anything like that, or it's, it's worse or, no, I think there's tremendous value in representation, but in other ways, not in the ways that I'm talking about. I had this deep-seated need. I had this deep-seated need to represent. I have this need that I was talking about this at the beginning, this need to look at the world and respond to it and try and render it as accurately as I can. Um, the work that you see in the exhibition is my uh, intensive effort to render one particular subject as accurately as I can. Um, I have tried working with other media, I've tried working with other subjects, I've tried working in different ways, I've done photography and performance and all manner of things, but I always, always have this need to come, stubborn need, to come back to, to figurative painting. It's, it's a deep passion and a love of mine. So it's my job to try and reconcile these, this, this issue of the jump and my need to, to do what I, what I am passionate about. So how can I resolve this? How can I resolve this kind of, these sort of, strains these issues which are butting heads with each other. Um, I want to talk about another idea, another philosophical idea. There's a European philosopher called uh, Boris Groys and he's written about a theory called anti-philosophy. Anti-philosophy uh, anti -philosophy has a lot to do with what I'm talking about. Um, according to this philosopher Groys, uh, throughout the history of philosophy all across the world we have these very famous philosophers, these very famous texts, you know, think of like Plato and Socrates and so on. And these philosophers have some kind of um, self-evident value uh, that what they are saying emerges from a place of genius. We all think of the famous images of someone sitting in a garden and, you know, being very pensive and then the great idea comes in their mind. We, we have this kind of mythos of, of the genius and then they produce this text and it, it changes the world and the evidence is immediate and, and, and self-apparent. This was the narrative throughout most of the history of uh, at least Western philosophy and then in the late 19th, early 20th century we see a switch. Uh, we see the rise of rationalism, we see the rise of scientific research, uh, we also see the rise of 
global conflicts, um, different kinds of conversations being had around culture. And this mythos of the genius philosopher dissipates. Uh, we are now far more aware of the fact that uh, not just philosophers, but everyone comes from a particular place. We're all immersed in particular places. We all have our, our uh, backgrounds, our upbringings, and these inform the way we see the world. So contrary to what was previously suggested in this mythos of the universal, and, and usually I should mention male and usually white <laughs> artist, um, we now have a multitude of different voices, um, all arguing for their own truths. So uh, Boris Groys, this philosopher I'm talking about, says, well, how can we, how can we deal with this? If we, have, uh, if we, we can't really trust philosophy anymore because we know that everyone actually comes from their own cultural context and they aren't speaking for all of the human race, but they're only speaking out of their particular circumstances, their particular context, what can we do? Because we can either just stop reading philosophy, which feels wrong, because we still have this passion to learn about the world and understand it, or we can do something called anti-philosophy. And that's, this is what he proposes. Um, anti-philosophy is, is the assertion that, contrary to, to what these great genius philosophers once thought, is the assertion that anything, anything at all, can be appropriated and transformed into evidence for some kind of philosophical argument uh, based on recontextualization, placing it into a different context. Um, I know this sounds a bit vague, uh, but to give an illustration of what I mean, uh, he talks about the philosopher Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard was a 19th century Danish philosopher and he was very concerned with uh, Christianity and what it means to be a Christian. And according to him, he came up with this, uh, with this idea that uh, if Christ were to come back today, he would be unrecognizable because at the time that he was uh, historically active, he was much like everyone else on Earth. He, he didn't have, you know, we, we look at the artistic representations of, of this figure. We have the halos and the, the, the beams and so on, but as described in the historical or, or biblical texts, he was a commoner. He behaved like a commoner, he lived in a common environment. And likewise, Kierkegaard's argument was that if Christ were to come back today, he would look just like everyone else. And the only way you would know that he was some kind of uh, was the Messiah was if he was if he revealed it in a different context if he did something which transcended this um, this painting is by does anyone recognize this painter Fran this is Francisco de Zurbaran uh, from the I think, 16th 17th century he was a Spanish Baroque painter and he uh, of course and like a lot of the other artists in that time was deeply embedded in uh, the religious circles of Europe and he did a lot of religious paintings he did lots of paintings of saints but uh, this painting has always stood out to me. It's, uh, it's very special. It's called Agnes Dei. I think some of us may know Agnes Dei, this sort of Latin term, the, the lamb. Uh, this is sort of uh, the mythos of the, of the lamb, the sacrificial lamb being like Christ, that this was a helpless figure who was brought on to be, to, to be sacrificed. And so the lamb stands in as a kind of symbol. But what I think is special about this painting is that um, the, the painter Zoberan, he chose not to add any kind of um, symb symbolic sort of gestures onto it. So there's, no, there's another version of his painting where there's a halo around the head of the lamb. But in this one, there's no halo. There's no God rays, there's no angels or cherubs floating in to explain what's happening. As we see in a lot of other biblical art, it's just the lamb itself. But we still know that it has some kind of biblical significance because of the context it's been placed in right now. I'm talking about it and I've, I've explained what some sort of notion of its meaning is. Likewise, if we take a lot of other artworks or objects and we place them into a different context, we can give them a kind of meaning. Boris Groys, this philosopher I'm talking about, he says, uh, that a lot of the, the there are anti-artists and uh, we think of like the Dadaists in the early 20th century, these artists who were the first to say, hang on a minute, um, instead of sitting in your studio and being this kind of, you know, a lone figure who makes the, the mythical, magical artwork that comes out and it's this work of genius, we can just actually point at objects and we can say, no, this is an artwork. We can say a broom is an artwork. We can say that chair is an artwork. And it becomes an artwork in virtue of its recontextualization. You put it into a gallery, now it's an artwork, because we say so. 
Now, of course, a lot of people disagree with these ideas, uh, ha have historically disagreed with them, and to this day the arguments continue. Um, but the key thing I think that unites all of these different disparate ideas is that all these acts are based on, on, a, on a leap of faith. It's the assertion that um, we're living in this world which is very hard to, to understand and there's a lot which is hidden from us. And these great philosophers, these voices who were once a great guide for humanity, who could show us what to think or what to believe, their voices are now in some way, uh, they, those voices have been lost, those guides have been lost. Groy says, well, in that case, we have to make a leap. We have to make a jump. We can't rely on evidence. We can't rely on some kind of axiomatic first principle which is going to explain what we need to know. But once we make that jump, we then enter into this world of, of knowledge. We're entered into this world of anti-philosophy where we can appropriate all kinds of different ideas together to produce something which will allow us to, to lead a meaningful life. So um, I'm talking about anti-philosophy, but I, I extract from that a, a notion of um, what I call anti-representation. So I've been talking about representation, right? This idea that there's a thing in the world, there's the gap, and then there's the, the image that you make. And my need to be if a representative painter against all the odds, against all of these, these sort of pressures that I've been talking about. Sort of taking uh, Groys's and Kierkegaard's cue and a number of other cues, I, I've come up with this, what I call anti-representation. Uh, what that basically means is I'm using the language of representation to make something which is not a representation. It's a paradoxical image. Uh, this is a work I made earlier this year. It's called Reliquary Number no. 1. Um, this image is informed by the history of art. It is ostensibly a still life. And the name, reliquary, alludes to uh, historical Christian art as well. These kinds of ideas of some sort of object which uh, retains some kind of notion of something divine, something beyond uh, itself. Um, but at the same time, I've, I've placed it into this context where nothing is quite certain. There is no ground to the image. There's no backing. And I'm using material which doesn't have a historical meaning, in this case, duct tape. Duct tape is not historically valuable. You don't see a lot of artworks which valorize duct tape. But I've taken this duct tape and I've made a kind of subject and then I'm reconstituting it. Um, an analogy for what I'm doing is like poetry. We think of poetry, right? Poetry is like language but also isn't language. What I'm saying right now is language. I'm trying to communicate some ideas. Poetry takes the building blocks of languages and then it rearranges them to make something new something that relies on language but is not itself language. And by playing with different words, by playing with the intonation, with their meaning and so on, poetry can create new meanings. That's what I'm trying to do with painting. I'm trying to take the symbols, the codes of historical painting and switch them up so that although ostensibly it looks like something which could be historical painting, it, it isn't. It's something new. It's like a kind of Trojan horse, if you will. Um, I've been exploring these ideas in a number of different works. Lately, I've studied a, a series of drawings called uh, Studies for a Holy Vehicle. And again, I, I, use, I, I use religious symbolism in a lot of the titling for the work to kind of allude to this idea, again, of something, something beyond the surface, something elsewhere, something that could be divine but isn't immediately apparent. Uh, this is one of the first works I made in the series this year, and it's composed of a series of different seeming objects which come from our world. Um, they refer to certain principles of light, shadow, and form. So you have something which appears to be real, but of course isn't real. It's, a, it's entirely fictitious. It comes, comes out of my head. So we have this kind of space which is both one thing and another. It's ambivalent. It's trying to collapse these kinds of ideas of light, shadow, form un into themselves. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I had an exhibition and a colleague of mine came and uh, she was looking at my work and, and she said, uh, it seems like in a lot of your work there's something hidden. And that, uh, that, hadn't, actually, that hadn't actually occurred to me, but I, ever since then I've been leaning more intentionally into that. I think that's a really 
potent idea. So for example, this is another, um, this is another drawing uh, I did earlier this year. Again, part of a studies for a holy vehicle series. Uh, it's called Valve. I had this idea of some kind of subterranean or extraplanetary opening, uh, some kind of entranceway or some kind of cavity. Oh, you have a question back there? Sorry. You said this was a drawing? Yes. What medium of drawing? This is, oh, it's not very big. It's about yay big. And it's a wax crayon. Yeah, thank you. Um, I had this idea for some kind of opening or some kind of entrance way, but I've placed it into this environment where, again, it's, it's not immediately obvious where exactly it is. Could be somewhere underneath the ocean, could be out on Mars, could be in a cave, could be in a forest, it could be a tree stump, or could be an artery, an opening into an artery of some kind. Um, I'm playing around with these different signifiers to, to create, try and create these forms which are simultaneously very realistic, but not realistic at all. Sometimes I'm also playing around with um, shapes, what, what it is for something to be a shape or to be an object. How do we know that it has some kind of form? Um, this one I, I decided to call Mother and Children, but I only came up with that name after the, the end of the, the work. So I'm, I'm playing around with that idea of sort of signifying that just by placing objects together in a space, we get a meaning that comes out of it that, that wasn't preeminent, that you have to go up to work and engage with it and then something comes out of that. Um, of course, in reality, that there, is no, there is no deep meaning to the work. It's just graphite or it's just paint. It's just something on the surface. You're the one that actually comes up and you're the one with your history of signifiers in your head, your sort of book, your encyclopedia, which we may be conscious or semi-conscious of. And we take those codes, those dictionary entries, and we create something in our own mind. So it's sort of an allusion to us as well as, as the work itself. Um, I'm constantly trying to, to look at whatever we don't, whatever we don't valorize, whatever is um, abject, whatever is not, uh, doesn't ordinarily occupy our attention. Uh, this one is called Grotto. Um, I was really seized by, by the, I liked the idea of trying to draw uh, a cavern or some kind of interior space but from the outside. So we're looking at some kind of possibly geo geological entity and seems to have some kind of entrance into it, but you don't get to see what's inside. You just get to see what's on the exterior. Um, in this case, a lot of, could be grass or kind of scrub. Um, I love bringing that out and, and, and drawing attention to, to those kinds of abjections. Uh, this is more recent work I completed a couple of months ago. Um, again, part of the same series, uh, but this one I decided to call Midden. The Midden is a historical site uh, where you'll find the detritus of remains of, of previous um, civilizations or, or previous occupants in a region. Um, I'm deeply indebted to the history, indebted I should say, deeply indebted to the history of uh, 17th century Dutch figurative painting. We think of the still life in particular, the hunting scene, right? We have the, the grand scene uh, where the, the landowners, the nobles have come back from the hunt and they've got all the game that they've caught and usually the dogs are running around as well and there might be some kind of fruit nearby. Um, in this case, I've, I've taken the structure of one of those paintings and just switched out the textures. So what you are seeing looks like it could be a 17th century Dutch still life or what, what have you, but it isn't. Um, but there is actually nothing in this drawing which is anything. That it's not, there's n none of these entities are based on any particular object in the world. They are completely fictional. But again, they rely on those precepts of light, shadow, form, texture, and so on that we have built up in our minds throughout the study of history and in our day-to-day -day navigation of the world. So I'm going to conclude with... Uh, the work that's in the show, Acolyte Number Two, uh, it's called that because it's uh, the second in a series of three. I completed the first, I think, in 2017, and then uh, the last was uh, just in when fall of last year. Um, the acolyte, again, that, that word has a lot of different meanings. Uh, partly it refers to someone who is a, a follower, someone who proselytizes on the basis of faith. So this could be some kind of faithful figure, someone who is in the pursuit of something. But I also think that that title, Acolyte, refers back to the viewer. It refers back again to this 
intrinsic faith that we have in an image. A lot of people come to me and they say, oh, you know, your, your, your paintings, they look just like photos. So they, I, re, I feel like I could reach out and touch it, right? I'm playing with that. I'm saying, well, but when you look very closely at, at the image, at the subject, what you're looking at is nothing. There's nothing here. It's not a portrait. There's no human being there. But it looks like it could be a portrait. It's, it's just in virtue of the shape on the surface, it, it alludes to the history of portraiture, that kind of anthropomorphic subject. It could be a still life because it uses material. It's an intensive focus on objects that I have observed. But it's also not really a still life. It's not really a, a grounding on which it would be situated as in historical art. It's not abstraction because it seems to be relying on certain principles of light, shadow, form, shape, and so on that I'm talking about. It seems to be something which could exist. Um, so. Again, I'm referring back to this kind of faith that the viewer brings into the image to complete it, to, to suggest that it is in some way real. Um, in effect, uh, what I'm saying is that you recognize a subject and yet you don't see it. And that's what really compels me as an artist is to continue to look and look and look and look and look at a painting and yet never be able to see it. So there is this, there's a kind of infinity which is tacit within the painting. Kind of this aspiration towards infinity to something beyond the surface. It's an analogy for something else that we, we can't quite get to, but I'm trying to compel us to, to, to move in that direction. Um, that concludes my talk. <laughs> so uh, now, if anyone has any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Yes, back there. Did you, in this series, were you looking at material or plastic, or is that just? imagination Right, it's a good question, yes. So these, these particular works, they are actually rendered from life. I uh, get the behind the scenes scoop on this. It's, uh, it's, uh, to actually make this, I, I got a camera tripod and then I placed uh, a bunch of different objects on top of it. There's a little box and there's also a, a skull, one of those skulls that you'd use in studies that's on top of there as well. And then I layered that in layers and layers of plastic and paper and then finally, there's a yellow poncho placed on top. Um, but I tried to arrange, it's, it's a maquette. I use the word maquette to describe this. Um, I tried to arrange them in such a way that it's not immediately obvious how the image was constructed, that you, know, you can't see the underlying structure or whether it exists in space. And in the first work, the one on the left, I'd, I'd wanted to try and make it a bit wider so that it was obviously uh, some kind of human figure. But then, as I was working on the second one, there's a lot of kind of spontaneity as I make the maquette. I don't have a final idea of what it's going to be. I'm just sort of assembling things together. It's almost like a collage or a, an assemblage work. Um, I was trying to figure out how to get this, you know, the, the sort of the, the, uh, the poncho to be wider so it, it would fill up the frame wall. But then I realized that if I left it as it, as it was to just droop down loose, um, that would kind of get rid of any idea of a shoulder and then that would, you, you're just undermining the idea of portraiture there and so it's not really a human figure anymore, it's something else. Yeah. Thank you. Very mysterious. <laughs> Very good for Yes. Sort of the same question but um, in reference to the grotto and the grotto, yes. These and the valve, yes. were you looking at photographs of textures and what were you Right, with well, these you? ones um, these ones are more from my, from my mind, yeah. Uh, as an artist, I've been, I've, I've been drawing my whole life. I, I do a lot of life studies. Um, I li and I like to think, I think I've built up some kind of, of some, some kind of my own sort of book of, I like to call it a book of assets. Like in my head, I've got these textures and lights and forms just sort of floating around. And I know that I can kind of extrapolate those and build something out of them on, on the page. So part of it sort of, part of it's coming almost from dreams. You know, I do get a bit of inspiration from these kind of dreamscapes. And then some of it just comes from sitting down and going, well, what happens if I start drawing a shape like this? And what would happen if I kept adding on to that? And this, this was, um, I had a very loose idea for what I wanted to do, but the final form wasn't, wasn't evident until I actually finished the drawing. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. You mean in terms of 
the, in terms the, of how you're leading with how ambiguous you're getting with your mm -hmm. imagery, mm -hmm. um, how much, how near are you trying to take the viewer? Maybe I'm not being myself mm -hmm. clear enough, but um, are you trying to leave it ambiguous so different people will see different forms? Yes. Or are you trying to be more specific about how I don't want people to be, to settle. I don't want people to be comfortable and, and say, to, to know, to, to have like a final reading, to, to be able to say with certainty, okay, I think it's this. I want, I want people to be constantly mobile. Uh, I think that's how the work gets a life. It, it, I, use, I use anthropomorphisms a lot, but, but, but it gives it a kind of life by that constant movement <coughs> that, um, that you aren't able to sort of settle in with any one particular uh, reading. But, but, you know, I, I'm also, I think it's really critical for me to, to say that I'm totally open to the other readings that, that people bring to work. And I think that's one of the greatest things about art and about looking at art is that it's an opportunity for you to come up with your own kind of narrative. And I guess that's partly part, one of the other reasons it's important to introduce some ambiguity into the work is to allow people to pr give, get their own reading, to contribute to the work in, in a way. Okay. Well, uh, unless there's any other... Oh, I yeah. just wanted to say that I enjoyed your work very much, and, and one of the things I, I, I enjoy a lot of is, uh, realistic work, or what I would say is working in realism and painting, but sometimes when it's taken too far, um, I find that there's nothing for me to add as a viewer to the picture right. itself, mm -hmm. but with your piece, I keep going back to it, and you know, I haven't figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, you know, there is that sense, even though it's, it's done with such a fine finish, there's that sense that uh, I, I can, you know, I can take it another step and so Right. Thank you. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm going for, is, is, because I do think that's a lot of, that's something I, I try to refrain from total photorealism, or that there's, that there are certain techniques which do push it to the utter max, you know, I see lots of portraits of, people, you know, painting the individual skin cells on a face or something. And I, and I, I think that in some way, uh, I have challenges with that way of working. I think it can, I think it can undermine the, the subject. So leaving a little bit of a gun, uh, leaving a, just a little bit for people to do the, the labor themselves. Um, I think that's, for me, that's quite critical. Yeah. I, well, I, I think you must be successful because when I first saw this piece from a distance, well, this is photorealism, and somebody's just photographing a range of plastic scrap, and what's that doing in our show? <laughs> and when uh, I approached it more closely, and I understood for one thing it was an oil, mm -hmm. it became far, far more interesting, and that mm -hmm. the skill of the brush is, is, is quite wonderful. Thank you. And so, um, if you wish to provoke Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I, as I say, I, I think, I think realism is a, um, it's a way to bring people in. Uh, I think I was, I was talking earlier about the, this sort of universal drive to represent, to figure that everyone has, and I think part of that dynamic is where we are also drawn to images. We can't help but be drawn to images. We, we, we see something and we, we want to look closely at it, and especially working with realism or whatever you want to call it, that. That, ha that does something. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of artists and theorists and critics who say, no, it's, they just want to dismiss it. But I, I personally think it does something to the human mind. I think there's something about those kinds of images which compel us, which compel us to look closely at them. So it's, it's, kind, of a, it's, a, it's kind of a sneaky thing to, to, to paint in that way because it, it brings people in. It, my hope is it tries to, to grab. Yeah. But thank you. Okay. Well, I'll be around for a bit uh, if anyone else has any questions. Uh, but thanks again so much for coming out. It really means a lot. Uh, this is a, um, I feel enormously privileged to be here, as I say. And uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.